Hey everybody, welcome back. So I thought I'd do an episode today on the concept of willful tolerance. I had brought this concept up when I was speaking um, in my interview to David Powers a couple weeks ago, and I've had a lot of people reach out about it, that it makes sense to them. And so I thought I'd break it down a little bit further, talk about it a little bit more. Um, willful tolerance is not something that I came up with. Um, in fact, um, it's, it's, it's a term that actually Sally Winston and Martin Seif, who are um, therapists and writers who focus on anxiety and OCD. And in fact, I think they really pull it from Claire Weeks, who I do reference a lot on these videos, because in her work, she was constantly talking about needing an attitude of willingness, willingly accepting, willingly allowing whatever thoughts, feelings, or sensations to be there. It wasn't enough just to say, I accept you're there, I accept you're there. It was willingly saying, okay, you're here and I willingly accept you while I try to go about my life as best I can. So the idea of willful tolerance, um, I like that better than acceptance. We keep hearing that word and I think it turns into it starts to lose its punch to me after a while. I don't know if that happens to you guys, but when you hear something over and over and over and used in lots of different ways, it starts to feel like nailing jello to a tree where you're like, what? <laughs> you know, what, how do I do that, right? And so willful tolerance is we're already tolerating these symptoms. We're already tolerating these thoughts and feelings and sensations, but are we doing it willingly or are we doing it with an attitude of resistance, with adding fear to fear, terror to terror, anger to the symptoms? Um, are we, is our attitude of willingness there? And I think that um, that's really key, okay? And, I, and again, you hear me in my, in my episodes talk a lot about this. And I want to clarify something because I was talking to one of the benzo coaches the other day, um, and she made a really good point. And I, I hope on my videos something's clear, and if it's not, I want to clear it up. She had said, you know, I think you know you might believe that being able to do deep therapy while in the midst of a of a withdrawal is possible, and she wasn't really thinking that it was possible. I agree with her. I actually don't believe that a time to be doing deep dive therapy, deep intensive couples work, deep intensive family work, deep intensive individual work is while we're in the middle of this neurochemical shitstorm. We're just not ourselves, guys, right? So part of doing that deep dive work is being able to authentically show up. <laughs> and, you know, we're trying to be authentic, but when, you know, the dots aren't connecting, it can be really challenging. And so I agree with her. And if I've, if, I, if that's what it's felt like I've said, then please know that that's not what I'm talking about. Um, what I am talking about and what I have found helpful for at least me is that as I continue down this journey and I have good days and bad days and good moments and bad moments and good moments and horrific moments, right? Um, alongside this practice of willful tolerance, has to be behavior. And I've talked about this a lot, but I'll reiterate this. So what do I mean by behavior? Well, again, we're dealing with this raw nervous system, right? And the amygdala, I've talked about this in my last couple of videos, doesn't speak English, right? Or it doesn't speak Spanish or it doesn't speak, you know, Italian, whatever your language is. It doesn't speak that language. It speaks the language of behavior. And what happened to me in this is that as a result of this neurochemical shitstorm, and then also as a result of my getting really terrified of this neurochemical shitstorm, um, I began to become very, very afraid of a lot of things, and fear became kind of the, the pervasive experience of my life. Um, and my initial reaction when it got really acute and bad was to just stop everything. Now, I, looking back, I don't think I had much choice. Um, and I think that's true for many of us. I mean, I was just not functional on a, wasn't just a mental, emotional level. It, it was a physical level. I had akathisia, I had pain, um, I had dizziness, I had vertigo, I had blurry vision, I had raging tinnitus, um, I was weak. Um, so, and then cognitively, um, for a while there, I was you know, struggling as well, although that's been the least impacted of my, the spheres of my being. <clears throat> but 
my point is, is that there was a long time where, you know, had I, had I come, had I come to this realization of willful tolerance plus behavior, um, at that point, I might have been able to practice the willful tolerance, although it would have been a stretch because my my brain was misfiring at such a speed that it was just, you know, like I was in a completely altered state. And my behavior would have been, all right, maybe get up and go brush your teeth, like maybe get up and try to make your own lunch. And like, maybe I could have done those things. So I really want to reiterate for those of you listening that there is a trajectory that we're on. There is a um, there's a spectrum at which we're operating, right? And so sometimes these audios and videos and things that we watch in the Benzo community can be very frustrating if it feels like there's a one-size-fits-all to this approach because there's no possible way that there is. I mean, there's not even a one-size-fits-all for one individual person because one day, one week, one month to the next can actually be radically different in terms of symptom presentation and functionality. But anyway, back in the day when I was really impaired, I don't, you know, I could have, I, I, I would have liked to have had this mentality. I would have liked to have had this information. I, I don't know that I could have done a whole lot with it except really try to practice not adding a lot of negativity and fear and terror and catastrophic thinking and ruminating and researching to my already heightened, heightened state. Uh, but in terms of the behavioral stuff, I don't really know what I could have done. I just wasn't able. As things began to slowly consolidate for me a little bit, um, I began to take steps out. So I hadn't driven myself, but one or two times in nine months, I began to do that. Now I'm driving, you know, back and forth from my little town to Houston. You know, I drive probably 10 hours a week, sometimes more. Um, So, you know, on freeways and, and driving... Driving anxiety was never a part of this for me. Um, So, or feeling like I was confident enough to drive has not been really a a part of this for me, although it was for about nine months where it was impossible. But anyway, I wanted wanted to come back and reiterate that I'm I'm not thinking, hey, just get into therapy and do some work. No, I actually don't think this is the most useful time to do that. In fact, when I've, I'm not doing coaching at this point, but when I have talked to families just as a fellow traveler, I have said, like, stop pushing your loved one to get into these deep conversations about the nature of your relationship right now. You know, they're not, they're not firing on all cylinders. They're, they're in survival mode. Again, using my metaphor that I always use, you know, you're not going to conduct couples therapy or family therapy while you're in a riptide, right? You might do it on the beach, but you're not going to do it while you're in a riptide. You can't. You can't juggle survival with anything, whether it's listening to music and enjoying it or feeling joy or contentment in your life or feeling at peace or being able to do and make use of psychotherapy. That's just my thought. Now, I think there's different places in the trajectory of the process where we have more access to ourselves. We still may not feel like ourselves. Like for example, for me, I have a lot more access to functionality. I'm able to look very functional to people around me, <clears throat> despite the fact that I know that I'm grappling with a lot. Um, <clears throat> I'm also able to have more access to myself. And so I am able to implement willful tolerance and I'm also able to implement behavior more. And so what I try to do is, you know, like I said to you guys before, I get a lot of my data and information from the world of anxiety because there's just much more written about that than there is about the nervous system or medication injury or what it's done to us. And what's interesting, as I've shared many times, is that in that, in that world of high anxiety, um, whether they're talking about the nervous system specifically or not, I've met people that their hands go numb. I've met people that are bedridden. I've met people that are housebound. I've met people that live in fear all the time. I've met people that, you know, are, are, you know, in a heightened state 24 seven. I've met people that have terrible vertigo, balance issues, headband feeling around their head, migraines, um, digestive issues, heart problems, palpitations, blood pressure issues. And these are people that never touched a benzo. So I've definitely met and talked to 
and seen and listened to many, 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 many people that sound like us, right? Which to me makes me feel a little better in the sense that it kind of points to the same problem, which is that there is some sort of nervous system malfunctioning going on and that ours is being, you know, it might have been chemically induced and it might be being chemically perpetuated. But I learn a lot from those forms and I learn a lot from those people. And Drew, I've, I've talked before about Drew Lynn Salata. There's a new podcast out and he works with a guy named Josh Fletcher out of the UK. And the new podcast is called Disordered. And these are two men who both are therapists now, but um, had really debilitating anxiety. Um, and I like it because a lot of the concepts they use, I think, can be applicable for us. But what I want to hear, because I have sometimes people talk about this, I'm not saying we just have an anxiety disorder. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the nervous system, okay, that we know f- full well, because you know, if we're talking about GABA, or we're talking about neurochemistry, we're talking about neurochemistry, we're talking about our nervous systems, right? And so, you know, in thinking about how to, how to use what I'm learning from those other places and apply them to our situation where I think it makes a lot of sense is that we're dealing with nervous system sensitization that for many of us was chemically induced through being put on the med or trying to come off the med and is chemically perpetuated until our neurochemistry balances itself out. In the meantime, what can we do? And that's where I pull from what I can gather from the work that they do. So I was listening to a couple of Drew and uh, Josh's new podcast. There's like four episodes called Disordered. And <clears throat> Josh made a comment that I thought was really interesting because it, again, applies to how we have to think about this as well. And he talked about anxious recovery. So let's just take out the word anxious recovery and put in benzo recovery, okay? But his quote was, anxious recovery is measured by your willingness to tolerate anxiety, not the accumulation of its absence. So let's take out anxiety and put in benzo withdrawal, okay, or benzo withdrawal symptoms, okay? So benzo recovery is measured by your willingness to tolerate symptoms, not the accumulation of their absence, okay? This is another way of saying that other quote that I say where it's not where you no longer have symptoms. It's when the symptoms no longer have you. That's the shift in mindset that we're trying to make in this. And it's tricky when you are not firing on all cylinders. It's hard to do this when you are firing on all cylinders, but when you're not, it's, 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 it's incredibly difficult. So, um, you know, I, I, the other thing they talk about on one of their podcasts is this idea, Josh calls it a miracle thought. He talked about in his recovery, again, not from benzos, but from anxiety and from OCD. The miracle thought was if I could get to just, if I could just sit with myself, if I could just stare at the wall, if I could just research, if I could just Google, if I could just benzo, you know, um, benzo buddy, if I could just get to that right thought and unlock it all and make it all okay, I could, if I could just stay home and figure it out. And this is where... I know I land a lot of the time and did land a lot of the time, and maybe you're there too, which was this feeling of, I've got to figure this out. I've got to figure this out. Well, I was told it was benzo withdrawal, and that reassured me for about five minutes, right? And it's not that I doubt that it's benzo withdrawal. It's just that there's this part of my brain that's like, but what if? What if it's depression? What if it's something, what if it's old stuff coming back to roost? What if it's... Uh, new stuff that never you know, presented before. What if it's a neurological issue? What if everyone was right and it was repressed rage? All along? I mean, you know, my brain can jump to these places, right? Because again, I've got no breaks. That's part of our neurochemical shitstorm is the breaks, the GABA, the, the balancing agent, the buffer isn't working. So what's working is the gas pedal. So my brain wants to just kind of, you know, it feels like the eggs are sliding off the plate half the time as I'm you know, getting into these what ifs and what ifs and what ifs. And, and so again, this idea of the miracle thought and that there is no miracle thought. And I thought about it as it relates to us for sometimes for us, there's like a miracle moment. 
Like if, 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 if we could just, if we could just take the right supplement, if we could just talk to the right doctor, if we could just, you know, get to the right place in our taper, if we could just figure out the right taper, if we, whatever it is, if we could just find the right alternative adjunctive med to make this, the miracle, right? We're all looking for that miracle. And the problem with that is that keeps us in that endless search mode. Well, when you're in an endless search mode, you're not really willfully tolerating and allowing and accepting what is as is, right? We've already figured it out. If you're listening to my stuff, <clears throat> you've already figured it out. <clears throat> it's just we don't really like the answer. Why don't we like the answer? Because there's not that many people um, out there to help us once we've found that answer. In fact, we're relying heavily on each other as peers to navigate this really tough time. So willful tolerance is a practice, um, just like walking into your kitchen or getting out into your yard or driving to the store. Um, you know, I was waiting for many, many, many months to feel better to do things until I started to realize, I don't know when that day is going to come. If I keep waiting to feel better to do things, I could be waiting forever. You know, you know, maybe not, but when I'm in the world of anxiety and watching these people that are not trying to heal from a benzo, who are waiting to feel better from their anxiety, agoraphobia, monophobia, you know, panic, whatever, uh, and, and also a host of physical symptoms that they have that are very similar to us, they don't get better right? Because if they're waiting and they're scared of their state and they're just in wait, they don't get better. Now, I've listened to many people who've healed who've said they didn't do anything specific, right? And, and they got better. And I believe that because I do think that we are in a neurochemical shitstorm that will calm down and we will feel marginally better. However, my point has always been if I spend three years being a worry wart, if I spend three years living in terror, if I spend three years being afraid to leave my bedroom, yeah, my GABA and glutamate neurochemistry might come into balance and it might be easier to leave, but I've created now some pretty bad habits, okay? And we know in the world outside of benzos, habits are hard to break, guys. And this is why you know we're, we're notorious for having New Year's resolutions to fail because habits, so we have habits of thought in this. Our habits of thought in benzo withdrawal can be quite negative and catastrophic. We're wired to think that way right now, but we have to be mindful of it. So willful tolerance, again, is, is the recognition of, okay, this is where I'm at. This is what I've got. I've figured it out. And this is where, you know, also in the world of anxiety, what I saw people doing was racing to yoga, meditation, breathing techniques, ice water baths, um, staying hydrated, nutrition, supplements, like all these things, right? And again, these, these coping mechanisms, these uh, lifestyle changes have merit. They're good for you, right? But if you're doing them, I'm going to meditate because I'm feeling so afraid. So I'm going to meditate my fear away. It doesn't really work that way. You meditate to, to boost your, your emotional muscles, your cognitive muscles. You meditate to learn how to practice clearing your mind, right? But you don't meditate as an intervention on this, okay? And so it, I've said this many, many times, and I'll just say it again. If you hear a fly, I, if you hear something buzzing, I have a fly in my space, and it's driving me crazy. Um, we don't employ coping techniques to get rid of symptoms, okay? We employ those strategies because they're good for us. They're good for our parasympathetic nervous system. They're overall good for our health. Moving a little more, like Jen's four cornerstones, for example. They're amazing things to employ in your life. David Powers, Pushing and Lulling, Michael Preeb's program, um, you know, Angela's ideas about things. All these different people who, Chris Page, all these different people who have these um, ideas or ways of thinking about things, it's not st strategy. It's not 
Um, I, I eat better to make this go away. I eat better because it's good for me. It's good for my gut health, it's, which will be ultimately good for my mental health. It's good for my immune system. All of these things are wonderful things to do. But if you're doing them out of fighting your symptoms, if you're doing them out of fixing something, right, then that mentality is going to drive the anxiety. It's going to drive you into checking. Oh, God, I've been working out and eating well and trying to be more independent, and I'm still no better. You know, and then you start to get defeated and deflated. And then, you know, that's when I always talk about that Stockdale paradox, right? The people that didn't do well as POWs, they didn't survive, were the ones that said, you know, I'll, I'll keep my attitude up till Christmas because I'll be home by Christmas. And then at Christmas, they were still locked in their cage and they would get mentally defeated. Many of them didn't make it. Um, the one that did has said, his attitude was, one day I will be free of this. Until then... I've got to be responsible for my attitude about my current situation. And so that's, that's when, again, I always go back to that because it's the most meaningful thing. But again, really hard to do. Um, you know, I've got a, a couple people that I, you know, there's just a very small, very small handful, not even a handful of people that I turn to about my symptoms. Um, I don't really talk to my family about them anymore. I don't really talk to... Um, I don't even really talk to my partner that much about them anymore. Um, I, I, they can see it when I'm having a, a tougher time, especially my partner, but I have you know, a handful of people that on a really rough day I might reach out just to get a reality check, but probably not to spend a lot of time talking about it because when I used to do that, I dug holes. This isn't to say further isolate yourself. Definitely don't do that. But it is about, that's also a behavior, right? If I get on the phone like I used to and cry and say, oh my God, my burning skin and my, I can't stop moving and I'm scared. And it, it, it ultimately didn't bring me any relief. And what it potentially did was it showed that system that was already misfiring and malfunctioning. Yes, yeah, send more, send more troops in. Jen's, Jen's freaking out, Jen's scared. There's something here send more cortisol, send more adrenaline, right? I don't know if I was making myself worse, but I know that I wasn't making myself better, okay? So going back to Josh's original comment, I'll just, again, insert our words, benzo recovery is measured by your willingness to tolerate the symptoms, not the accumulation of their absence. And the accumulation of their absence is when we start to have maybe better moments or better days, and then it comes back. And we think, oh my God, I'm just square one. No, you're not. Um, I've had people reach out recently and say, I'm having a window, and then the next day I'm having a terrible wave. And the next day I had two people in the last week tell me this is the rapid cycling. Okay. But again, you know, the, 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 the day where you're symptom-free, use that as your barometer because that's showing you Health. It's showing you your brain knows how to do this. It's just not there yet. It just hasn't gotten to that next step where it can stay there, but it keeps visiting. And if it can visit, then it can stay. And if you haven't gotten to a place yet where your brain chemistry is visiting a moment of clarity or a moment of peace, a moment of rest, you'll get there. Um, but I wanted to come on and again, just clarify that about the therapy thing and make sure that I'm not, make sure that I'm you know, that you guys are understanding what I'm saying. Um, and then again, talking about this attitude of willful tolerance and then behavior, okay? And again, behavior can be not going on and researching for the thousandth time. So behavior can, can also be what you're not doing. Um, I'm not going to call my safe person 10 times a day. Maybe I'm going to call them twice. And then I'm going to work on not calling them at all. Or, or, and, or I'm going to call my safe person and talk about something other than my fear or my symptoms. Um, and it can feel like you're starving it out, which can actually feel scarier. And again, I'm not saying be isolative. I'm not saying don't talk to people. I'm just saying that a behavior towards health could also be, um, you know, shifting your focus a little bit. And 
sometimes that's you know slowing down how much we are engaged in. I mean, I know at one point I had, I don't know, benzo buddies and benzo warrior and beating benzos and probably three or four others and five people going through it and read it. And, and uh, I mean, I was just a machine. You know, I was just saturating myself in this. And like I said, on one hand, it was a benefit because I learned a lot. But at some point for me, there was a point of I wasn't getting the return on my investment. And I still stay connected loosely to a couple of Facebook groups. Um, I loosely, loosely, loosely stay connected to Benzo Buddies. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing. I'm not saying give up on these things. I'm just saying pay attention to them in terms of how you use them. Pay attention to how much you're feeding um, the beast, We know what this beast is. We know how bad it is. We know how hungry it is. And it's always hungry, guys. It will always munch on the fear. It'll always chow down on the terror. It'll always chow down on catastrophic thinking. It'll always sidle up to the buffet and start slamming down, you know, course after course of dread and doom and gloom and worst case scenario and what ifs and if onlys and... It, it, it loves this stuff. And at some point, we have to stop feeding that beast. So um, anyway, I hope this was helpful. Um, I'll keep coming back through and, and, and sharing things as I do, but did want to start here and uh, come back to this idea of willful tolerance. Thanks, guys.